I hate to ask you this question only because I don't like the question, but why not ask you? Is math invented or discovered? It is both, but more specifically, I think you, you go out and you discover stuff based on your existing, either your world or your existing math. You use those discoveries to inform the definitions of the next step. And then you make more discoveries in that next step. And then you use those discoveries to inform the definitions further on. Venus of all planets is the closest planet to us in the solar system. So if it's got asteroids up front and asteroids in tow, and they're hiding in plain sight in the glare of the sun, we're at risk of one of those asteroids getting dislodged from its orbit and having us in its sights. And we would, wouldn't even know it had occurred. Unless it sort of entered Earth orbit and showed up on the other side of us from the sun, then we discover it, but by then it might be too late. My colleague, Steve Soder, brilliant guy, and he's fundamentally a solar system guy, he wrote a research paper that demonstrated that the planets we now have, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, in their locations is the maximum number of planets you can fit into the orbital space of this solar system. If you put another planet in of any size, Jupiter-like or otherwise, the gravitational fields of the other orbiting planets would wreak havoc on its orbit and it would either crash into a pre-existing planet, crash into the sun, or be ejected from the solar system. We know enough about the universe to quantify our ignorance. Everything you learn about in school in science, like I said, the laws of physics, chemistry, biology, evolution, planet forming, star forming, all of this is 4% of the universe. Wow. And who is to say that we are intelligent enough to actually understand the universe? So the idea that we are smart enough to understand the universe, there's a little bit of hubris in there, I would say. <laughs> The United States, NASA, has an accelerated plan to deliver a nuclear power plant to the moon. It's a nuclear power device that can produce 100 kilowatts of power. It's not a major power plant. It is an energy source that would be sufficient to sustain a small colony, a small settlement. The expansion of the universe is the entire universe, but when we speak about it in practical terms and what your telescope can see, and we see, quote, the edge of the universe with your telescope, that's the observable universe. But we, I, myself as well, have been a little sloppy there, distinguishing the universe from the, the, observable the observed universe. universe. I get a little sloppy, and I ask forgiveness there. The whole thing expands, right. but the part that's expanding that matters to us is within our horizon. Right. We don't think of just living on Earth as a centrifuge, but in a way it is. On Earth, you live in a centrifuge of 1G. That's why your Italian salad dressing settles out, okay? The denser material goes to the bottom, the lighter goes to the top. That would be the vinegar, which is denser than the oil. You just centrifuged it by just setting it down in Earth's gravity at 1G. If it was 2G, that process would happen faster. Let's say on Earth, you can lift 100 pounds. Okay. We have to ask, what does that 100 pounds weigh on, on Mars? Mars? Weighs 40 pounds. Right. So on Mars, you can lift more than your 100 pounds. Right. Because it doesn't weigh as much, not because you're stronger. <laughs> exactly. If you're gonna build something right. structurally, it doesn't weigh as much on the supports. Okay. So you can build bigger structures right. in lower gravity than you can here on Earth. Cool. How much do you weigh in water? Zero. You're neutrally buoyant. You'll slowly sink or you'll slowly float. But basically, because humans, depending on how much fat to muscle density you have, but some will sink and some will float. So on average, we have the same density of water. So in water, we don't weigh anything. Put a scale in water and stand on it and read it. Okay? That's what I'm saying. Okay. okay. So when you don't weigh anything, then structurally, you're not putting yourself at risk. And that's why the largest creature there ever was is a mammal and it lives in the ocean. It's a whale. The blue whale. So so when they say, how much does a whale weigh? The answer is zero. They give you a weight. And how do they give you a weight? They take it out of the water, right. put it on a scale on the on dry land. And then it weighs you know, a gazillion tons. But that's not the weight that the whale feels as it moves through the ocean. Neil, if I were to go to space and I wore dress pants and I didn't iron them, is space capable of taking the wrinkles out or am I going to be in space wrinkled up? Kevin, my man, you don't have to iron clothing to get rid of the wrinkles. They have these steam irons. You can take out the wrinkles if you just glide up and down with a, a heat source that has steam within it. You can do that. If I put you close enough to a star, the energy from the star will heat your body you will sweat trying to stay cool 
hole, that sweat will evaporate and steam your pants. You'll be like a <laughs> salmon. Steam salmon, steam salmon inside the foil. <laughs> They're the colors of the rainbow, right? Can you recite them? Do you know? Them? Red and yellow and green and blue and purple and orange and... Okay, Roy G. Biv. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Now, there's sensibly really only six colors there, but Isaac Newton had a mystical fascination with the number seven. He labeled indigo in there between blue and violet. So, we see these colors because we have sensors in three different parts of that spectrum in our retina. So, we have a red sensor, we have a green sensor, and we have a blue sensor. Right. This is RGB. Every television has it. It's why that's the thing. Right. It's to match our eyeballs, okay? But you have never noticed a time and you've never been a at a place without having noticed a time. So why should we believe they were ever separate? What would it even mean? For them to be separate. To be separate. It's not clear. So, so I can't imagine a higher dimension where you can move freely in the time coordinate. That's what you're talking about. Yes. Yeah. I got to quote Einstein here. Here. Time is defined to make motion look simple. I don't know what it would mean to have a universe without time. I'm not convinced. Right. Who do you think is the most extraordinary scientific mind? There is no contest, Isaac Newton. No, nobody comes close. He, working alone, discovers the laws of motion. Then he discovers the law of gravity, universal law of gravitation. Oh, and then someone asks, why do your planets orbit in this shape, ellipses, ovals, rather than perfect circle? They say, I don't know, I'll get back to you. And he goes home. And he comes back, I finally have my answer. And they say, well, Isaac, how did you do that? Well, I had to invent integral and differential calculus to answer that question. He then discovers the laws of optics, deducing white light is composed of colors, because you could take those same colors, recombine them, and get white light. He does all of this, then he turns 26. If you look at the distances between the planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, there's a huge gap between Mars and Jupiter. Okay. And people are saying, there should be a planet there. Yeah. This is in the 1700s. Let's look, there's gotta be a planet there. And we discovered a planet there. We discovered planet Ceres. And then Pallas, Investa, and Juno, the first four planets discovered in the asteroid belt. They're not planets, they're asteroids. They're star-like, asteroid, because they're tiny dots of light just the right. way stars are, because they have nothing to do with stars. People presume there was a planet there, they found these fragments. However, if you take all those fragments and glue them together into one object, mm -hmm. you get something about 5% the size of the moon. Well, that ain't a planet. <laughs> If you have a planet or anything that's orbiting close to something else that has strong gravity, tidal forces will slow down its rotation so that it'll only show one face to you. And so when that happens, it's called being tidally locked. We have locked the moon. There's a far side of the moon, there's a near side of the moon, but there is no dark side of the moon. Pluto and its moon, Charon, are close to one another. They have double tidally locked. They show the same face to one another as they move around. Mercury does not, and it's because Mercury has a resonance. Mercury feels the gravity of other objects in the solar system, in particular Venus. And when you feel another source of gravity in addition to that of the sun, the sun does not succeed in totally tidally locking. There's a tussle between the two objects.